Take your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of Esther, chapter 7. Let's stand together as we continue our series from the book of Esther. Today we turn to Esther 7 and 8, and uh, I'm excited about today's message as we see God delivering the children of Israel from the death sentence of Haman. And if you haven't been following along with us, all of these messages are posted at LancasterBaptist.org. I want to welcome everybody that's watching online, and I know there are many of you as well. Welcome today to LBCLive.tv. And we're excited about the Word of God. And I'm going to tell you something, as this world continues to unravel, and there's so much in the way of division, so much in the way of hatred, uh, and uh, we, we find hope in God's Word. And today, uh, I think you'll see that with me as well. We're going to read an entire chapter of the Bible. Everybody up to that this morning? And so we're going to read chapter 7. Follow with me as we read. So the king and Haman came to the banquet with Esther the queen. And the king said unto Esther on the second day at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? And it shall be performed even to the half of the kingdom. Then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we are sold, and I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Then the king Ahasuerus answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he and where is he that durst presume in his heart to do so? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. And the king, arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath, went into the palace garden. And Haman stood up to make request for his life to Esther the queen, for he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. Then the king returned out of the palace garden into the palace of the banquet of wine, and Haman was fallen upon the bed whereon Esther was. Then said the king, Will he force the queen also before me in the house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. And Harbanah, one of the chamberlains, said before the king, Behold also the gallows, fifty cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him thereon. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. Let us pray. Father, we thank you today for the word of God, for we know that it is more than history. It is his story. It is your story. And Father, we are a part of your unfolding plan of redemption as well. And so we pray that you would teach and guide us through your word this morning, that we would recognize the need to trust in you through all aspects and times of history. For we pray and ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, life has many unusual twists and turns. Uh, one minute, someone can be at the top of the world. The next minute, they can be going through great uncertainty and difficult times. It may be someone who owned a tremendous amount of Enron stock, and they thought they were very wealthy for life, and suddenly they were destitute. Uh, one day, there may be someone at the height of human glory, and the next day, their life is so very different. Napoleon on the eve of attacking Russia was approached by a woman who said to Napoleon these words, Sir, remember, man proposes, but God disposes. To which Napoleon said, No, madam, I propose and I dispose too. Just a few short months later, 80% of Napoleon's army had lost their life and his campaigns had come to an end. Richard Nixon, a very popular and brilliant president who brought detente with Red China, a man riding uh, the crest of popularity, suddenly 
through the tragedy of Watergate, lost all of that popularity, and lost the most popular office and powerful office in the world. We think of Judas Iscariot this morning, a man who was so trusted by Jesus that he held the finances of the early church, a man who had the privilege of walking with Jesus and talking with Jesus for three and a half years, a man who so bitterly denied the Lord Jesus Christ that he hung himself in an act of suicide. I'm saying to you this morning that many in their proud moments who feel that they are at the top of the world have found themselves in a place of great sorrow and degradation almost instantaneously. In the last message as we studied this book of Esther, we saw this man Haman who was just certain that he was at the top of the world as he had been invited to a meal with Esther and with the king and he was bragging to his friends and bragging to his wife of all that would take place in his life. As we open up chapter 7, the chamberlains have come and have brought him now to a second banquet. And again, he enters this banquet as the high and honored guest, just certain that he was uh, to be honored somehow. No doubt there was some doubt in his mind now as uh, the king had commanded him to honor Mordecai. And yet Haman was a man of great position and a man of great power as he came to this second banquet. As we open the Word of God this morning, we're aware of the backdrop of the story. We're aware that because of a deal made between Haman and the king, that the entire nation of Israel's lives were hanging in the balance. We're aware that the king had agreed to this idea of taking the lives of all of the Jewish people because Haman, in his anti-Semitic ways, determined that this would be best for the kingdom and offered a great amount of money to the king who had lost much of his income and much of his uh, royal bounty in his battle against the Greeks. And so, as we see God's plan unfolding, we are going to see this morning a plan of redemption. We're going to see that despite the difficult and dark hour the Jews faced, that God had a plan of protection for them. Hence the theme of our messages these last several weeks, God's got this. Because as we see the billows of darkness all around us, as we see wicked men in power in Sacramento and in Washington and everywhere in between, we must always be mindful that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and that our God is sovereign in all of these matters. And this is what we see in the book of Esther. I want you to notice as we open chapter 7 this morning, the request of Esther. The Bible tells us in verse number 3, Then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. Now, Warren Wiersbe wrote of this moment, When they arrived at Esther's palace apartment, neither the king or Haman knew that Esther was a Jewess. Haman was probably still distressed because of the events of the day, But he composed himself and hoped to enjoy the banquet. Had he known the nationality of the queen, Haman would have either run for his life or fallen on his face and begged the king for mercy. Now heretofore, Esther has not revealed to the king that she was a Jew. Uh, She had not availed that information to him. And it is apparent that the king, in signing many decrees and making many decisions, was not as attuned uh, to all that even Haman had done, as Esther is going to remind him in this passage today. And so we see the king literally prompting Esther, wanting to know what she needed. In fact, in verse 2, the Bible says the king said again, Esther, uh, he said, what is thy petition? Uh, it shall be performed unto thee on behalf of the kingdom. Again, the king is prompting and and, uh, he's being patient with Esther and he's saying to her, listen, the sky's the limit, Esther. What is it that you want? This is the second banquet that you've invited us to. There must be something very important on your mind. By the way, how many of you men, particularly married men, how many of you have been married long enough to know that when your wife is being very, very nice and she's putting on pounds of oil of Olay and makeup, and she's making you not just one meal, but two meals, she probably does have something she wants to ask. And that's what's going on here. 
Uh, there's a preparation of the heart through the meals and uh, through all of the entertainment of Esther. And the king is prompting her, Esther, what do you want? Why are we having these meals together? Well, notice if you would, secondly, Esther's petition. Esther had a sensitive ear, a wise heart. She sensed something wasn't quite right, so she had not been pushing her request. And now she begins with her petition. And I want you to notice how to approach a king. I do believe there are parallels here, not only for approaching someone that you may need to speak to this week at work or a supervisor, but even as we approach the throne of God, I believe there's a heart that can be seen in Esther that we must have in our time of prayer. And the Bible says in verse number three of chapter seven that Esther said, if I have found favor uh, in thy sight, we notice here a submissive spirit. We notice that she is approaching the king not with a demanding attitude, but with a submissive attitude. Not trying to tell the king what to do. We're taught by the Lord Jesus in his great disciples prayer that we're to pray, thy kingdom come, say the next part with me, thy will be done. Thy will be done. And oftentimes in today's society, people are picketing, uh, people are marching, people are throwing tomato sauce at artwork. I mean, some of the most ridiculous things that the earth worshipers do. Some of the most ridiculous things that the unsaved do to somehow get attention. But the mark of a godly man or woman is not their dramatics, but it is their humble heart. This is what I believe pleases the Lord as well. And Esther came to the king with a heart of submission. She comes with a heart of trust. She's not demanding. She's requesting. The Bible is clear to us in Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Here we see the submission of Esther. But we also see a boldness, and this is the wonderful balance in prayer, for we are taught to come humbly before the throne of God. We're also taught to come boldly to the throne of God by the blood of Jesus Christ. And notice if you would again in verse 3, it says, Let my life be given me at my petition, so my people and, and my people at my request. Notice in verse 4, For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed and slain and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondwomen and bond, bondmen and bondwomen, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Now up until this point, as we said a moment ago, her nationality had not been revealed. And Esther uh, is someone that is uh, uh, seeking God's wisdom. I believe she was praying every single step of the way as she had these meetings. And, and we see that she says in this passage, she says, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. She is now identifying with her people. It is not that she did not attempt to identify before. She never was asked. Uh, I don't know that there was ever reason particularly uh, prior to this time, some have surmised that maybe she should have. Uh, but this was the time appointed by God for this revelation. It was a time to identify. Let me say to every young person in this room and every teenager, there will come times in your life when it is the right time to stand up and identify as a child of the King, as a Christian. It might be when someone at work is taking the name of the Lord in vain as I did as an 18-year-old Bible college student, as I spoke up to men two and three times my age and said, hey, you guys keep using Jesus' name that way. I want you to know I love the Lord Jesus. He's my personal Savior. I want you to know it's highly offensive to me when the only time you use the name of Jesus is when you're cursing. There come times into your life when you identify and you say, I am a child of God. And in this moment, Esther is identifying as a Jew. And she is at this moment of weakness. She is strong in the Lord. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 12 and 7, regarding this matter of being perhaps the weaker one, the Bible says, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, 
the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What I see in Esther is in this uh, frail little orphan girl, I see a strength and a boldness that was not her own. I see a wisdom that was not her own. That's why no one here should say, well, I can't be a soul winner. I can't be a witness. I can't, I can't, I can't. Uh, listen, friend, the truth is we can do nothing without Jesus. But with Jesus, all things are possible. And the story of Esther tells us that with Jesus, a 17-year-old girl who is an orphan Jewess in a foreign land is going to be given the most prominent and powerful place in all of the kingdom because God rejoices in empowering weakness. And so when we simply say, Lord, I don't know how I can do this. I'm weak, I'm frail, I'm tired, I'm weary. God, work through me. And Paul, he said, Lord, I, I want you to heal me. I want you to heal me. And it is not always God's will to heal in every situation. He said, Paul, I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to give you strength. And the apostle Paul said, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my weakness that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And so Esther's petition is made from a standpoint of human weakness but we see also the power of God in her life. Well, we want to notice thirdly here the Jewish plight. I want you to see not only the king and the queen, but what about the Jews? Notice if you would in verse 4, again, the Bible speaks here, and it says very simply, For we are sold, and I and my people... And we are sold, Esther says, and she brings a reminder uh, they were sold to be slain. Uh, she is reminding the king that he had been paid blood money for the Jews. She's reminding him that when Haman gave great amounts of wealth to him, that he was paying for murder. He was paying to take lives that were innocent. She used the actual words of Haman from Esther 3 and verse 9, where it says, Let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it to the king's treasuries. This blood money that the king had received was perhaps to him just another transaction, just another way to uh, make some money, just another way to advance his kingdom. And how many times have wars been fought this way? How many times have people like Vladimir Putin attacked innocent villages in a place like Ukraine simply to expand his namesake, simply to expand his legacy, never mind the fact that babies and grandmothers' lives are being snuffed out by power-hungry men? And this is sometimes the case, that the lives of the innocent are not even thought about on the part of these wicked and ungodly men. Esther is reminding the king of the moral nature of war, of the immoral side, if you will, of the ungodly loss. Esther continues speaking to him in verse 4. She said, if we, if we would have been sold to be bondmen and bondwomen, I would have held my tongue. Uh, I want you to imagine, if you would, for just a moment, the diplomacy here of Esther. I want every college student and teenager to realize that the Bible says, if any man lack wisdom, he can ask of God who giveth to all men, uh, and, and God will give you wisdom, James chapter 1 and verse 5. And here's a woman with such wisdom. She is acting here as a diplomat, even in the midst of pleading for her life. She is saying to the king, if, if we would have merely been sold into slavery, I wouldn't have even bothered you. But this isn't slavery, king. This is blood on your hands, king. And she is showing to the king that she is actually in his, uh, on his side and actually trying to help him to do something right as the leader of the world. And so we see the request of Esther, very strong, very diplomatic, very much poised with the wisdom that only God can give. I don't know about you, but I need that wisdom every day of my life. 
Every day of my life I pray, James 1, 5, and I ask the Lord to give me wisdom in dealing with staff, in dealing with church members, in dealing with the haughty and the proud, in dealing with the broken and the weak, in dealing with whoever it is that God would bring my way on a given day. As much as Esther needed wisdom to stand before the king, you need wisdom to stand before your Sunday school class. You need wisdom to teach your children. You need wisdom today, like Esther needed the wisdom of God. But notice not only her request, notice secondly, the revelation of Haman. Haman is going to get his comeuppance here. And I want you to notice it, if you would, in verse 5. Then the king, Ahasuerus, answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he and where is he that durst presume in his heart to do so? Now, here's an amazing, amazing statement. We see that Haman is identified. And, and, and the king, uh, it's hard to imagine this question when he says, Well, who is it, Esther? Who is it that would have brought such a death penalty upon the Jews? Uh, I, I want to know who the culprit is. And we see the answer, of course, in verse 6. Esther says, uh, this wicked Haman. This wicked Haman. By the way, there is a Bible verse that we should remember this morning. Be sure your what? Sin will find you out. Be sure your sin will find you out. The adversary and the enemy is this wicked Haman. Proverbs 24 verse 1, Be not thou envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them, for their heart studieth destruction, and their lips talk of mischief. Sometimes if you're not careful, you might look at those in power. You might look at those who are making their millions producing marijuana. You might look at those who seem to have such power in their political office, and there might be just a little tinge of, wow, I wish I had that money, or wish I had that power. I want to remind you something from Scripture. Be not envious against evil men. You do not want their power. You do not want their blood money. You want to be right with God. Because it is appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. And we want to keep this in mind. Haman was a wicked, ungodly, conniving man. And the king is now coming to realization with respect to who this really was. And, and she says, uh, it is Haman that is behind this terrible deed. And it is no wonder that God had given Esther the sense not uh, to say anything at the first banquet. Because now... The king is identifying Mordecai, who had saved his life, with the Jewish people. And this is something that there was a unique timing involved. How could he now execute a group of people uh, of which are looking out for his best interest? How could he execute the people of Mordecai? How could Haman have set him up in such a way? And so the timing of Esther was impeccable. And the Bible is, speaks of this in Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. And so Haman is identified at the right time and in the right way. But notice, secondly, Haman now is indicted. The Bible says in verse 7, And the king arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath went into the palace garden, and Haman stood up to make requests for his life to Esther the queen, for he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. Now Haman is indicted, and we see the king is very, very angry. He goes out uh, to the garden. Uh, he is there, uh, perhaps uh, uh, sweating profusely, perhaps wringing his hands. I don't know what he was doing or if he was screaming out, uh, but we know the scriptures indicate he was full of wrath. And Haman comes to Esther. And the Bible says in verse 7 that he is begging uh, for his life. Uh, he's now seeing what has happened. And somehow, perhaps he tripped and fell. Uh, the Bible tells us he fell onto Esther's bed. And the Bible says in verse 8, Then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine, and Haman was fallen upon the bed whereon Esther was. And the king then said the king, Will he force the queen also before me in the house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Here the word force speaks of molesting or violating. 
He says, this man who tricked me, this man uh, who is a, a man with, uh, who has put me into this terrible situation, is he going to take advantage uh, of my wife as well? He's being indicted at this moment and, and uh, the guiltiness is, is rising with every passing moment. And so we see thirdly that Haman is punished. And notice the convenience of his gallows. The Bible says, And Harbona, one of the chamberlains, said before the king, Behold also the gallows fifty cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, which had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. Then said the king, Hang him thereon. Boy, you get an idea of these ancient empires. Uh, it was great. One minute for Haman to be the guy that was having dinner with the king and the queen, bragging to his wife, bragging to his friends, but then the next minute, hang him in the gallows. And we see how suddenly a man went from being at the top to being all the way at the bottom. Haman is punished on the gallows he had prepared for Mordecai. God is making all of those wrongs right. God is not asleep in heaven. God knows the wicked men who would not only sign laws to take the life of a preborn child, but who now promote the mutilation of children through their so-called transgenderism. Now we see on the news people uh, that are promoting drag queens in the public school. And if I was a parent and had my kid in a public school and they brought a drag queen to read in the school, let me tell you something, the school board would hear about it from me. The wickedness, the perversion, that has come into our land. And we see it everywhere. And as Christians, uh, we might wonder, what's going on in the United States of America? What is God doing? Well, I want you to know something that you can rest in this morning. That every one of these who reject God and who promote wickedness, they will be judged by Almighty God, just like Haman was judged. Now, as Baptists, we have been and will remain a nonviolent people. I am not preaching that it is our responsibility to take justice into our own hands. Is everybody hearing me on that this morning? That's not what I'm preaching. But I am preaching that in God's time and in God's way, He always makes things right. Okay? Notice in your notes, Romans 12, 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible... As much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Vengeance is mine. Now that does not mean vengeance is mine. Uh, as I said a moment ago, as a parent, I have not only the right, I have the responsibility to speak up for my children, to speak up for their uh, educational environment and so forth. But I have no right to vengeance. That is God's. And sometimes we wonder, well, why does God allow the compounding of a wicked man like a Vladimir Putin? Why does God allow that to grow and grow and grow, that wicked, evil influence? I do not know. I do not know why Hitler uh, uh, did what he did in massacring and killing millions of Jews. But I know this. There is a God that will recompense for evil. And the, the Bible is very clear. He will repay. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And so Haman is now the recipient of the vengeance of God. By the way, friend, I want to remind you, you don't want to be the recipient of the vengeance of God. Thank God for His grace. Thank God that if you trust His Son, Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Thank God that you'll not stand before the Lord for your sins, but you'll stand before Him at the judgment seat of Christ someday for the opportunities you took to serve the Lord. And yet you'll not be judged there. Your sins and mine have been judged on the cross of Calvary. Thank God for that. But we see here the revelation of Haman's justice. And we must be mindful of the fact that God is a just God. But notice with me finally this morning, the relief for the Jews. Perhaps the overriding story here is not merely Esther's faith, but it is the freedom that the Jews would receive. 
Haman's death did not automatically stop the evil decree. How do you, how do you kill one man and stop a decree that went about 127 provinces throughout the known world? Every one of those Jews were in peril. Every one of them could have been killed at any moment. And so we see how this takes place. Notice if you would in verse 1 of chapter 8. On that day did the king Ahasuerus give the house of Haman, the Jews' enemy, unto Esther the queen. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was unto her. In other words, Esther had indicated to the king that Mordecai was her cousin. And the king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman, and give it, gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Now here we see an amazing, amazing transference of power. Here we see Mordecai's destiny. Mordecai's identity has been revealed. He is the cousin of Esther. Uh, here we see that uh, sometimes the trials of this life, though they're difficult, uh, they are according to the presence and the timing of God. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Again, God was keeping track of all of this. Again, uh, the God who judged Haman is the God who promotes Mordecai. We see that God is in control of the entire situation. Romans 8, 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And I'm telling you, just as much as Mordecai was hated, just as much as Mordecai was put down, Christians today who are hated, preachers today who are put down, missionaries who are rebuffed, they will be rewarded in heaven by the grace of God. And this is a picture we see in the, in the story of Esther. But we see that uh, there is uh, Mordecai's identity being revealed and Mordecai being promoted in verse number two. And I want to say a small word about promotion. And I, I like what Butler wrote in his commentary. God will provide promotions if they are necessary to do his work. You do not need to pull strings, know the right people, bribe the powers that be, or manipulate people to obtain high position. If you need promotion to do God's work, God will see to it that you get it and you will obtain it in an honorable way. What's the basis of that statement? Look in your notes at Psalm 75. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. In other words, when the time came, God knew how to promote Mordecai. And I watched so many people. And I'm going to preach about this briefly tonight as I preach from 2 John and verse number 4. On, on how to discern God's work in your children's lives. And I'm going to speak to the fathers about how to discern God's will and how to find God's will. But I'm going to say, even this morning, uh, uh, promoting yourself is not how to find God's will. Pushing your resume is not always how to find God's will. Manipulation and, and uh, trying to make yourself look good on the internet. All of these things we see are not necessary in God's economy. God knows your address, my friend. And God will bring promotion when it's His time. You don't need to find yourself trying to interface. You don't need to try to get five stars or whatever it is on LinkedIn or wherever you go. There is a God in heaven who knows and has a plan for your life. We live in such a manipulative world. And I bring that to your attention because I do not believe Mordecai manipulated one moment. I believe to see that we see in Mordecai a man who just patiently waited on God to do his work. What a novel thought. Mordecai's destiny comes to pass. Notice secondly, the Jews deliverance. Now Mordecai and Esther no doubt are a part of a larger plan as we said a moment ago. And notice in chapter 8 and verse 3, Esther spake yet again before the king and fell down at his feet and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagite and his device that he had devised against the Jews. Notice verse 6, For how can I endure to see this evil that shall come unto my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? Now Esther is here beseeching favor, verse 3 says, and she besought him with tears. She is asking the king, O oh, king, my people, there's a death sentence upon them. 
There is a great need for their mercy. And the king provides freedom for the Jews. Verse 7, Then King Ahasuerus said unto Esther the queen and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman and him that they have hanged upon the gallows because he laid his hand upon the Jews. Write ye also for the Jews as it liketh you in the king's name and seal it with the king's ring for the writing which is written in the king's name and seated with the king's ring may no man reverse. Mordecai is now allowed to write a decree to spare the life of all the Jews. And this was to go to all 127 provinces. The Jews would be delivered. And that brings us thirdly to the Jews' delight. Notice their delight in verse 15 of this same chapter. And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white and with great crown of gold and with a garment of fine linen and purple into the city of Shushan. Uh, and the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. Notice Notice this, the Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and in every city whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness. Notice this now, and a feast and a good day. Notice, and many of the people of the land became Jews for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. The Jews are now rejoicing. I want you to be reminded of Genesis 12 and verse 3, that there is a promise from God that he will protect the Jews and that any nation that understands and lives to that principle will be blessed. And as we see also some in Washington, D.C., rising with their anti-Semitism, and we see it often around the world today, may we be reminded of the fact that God again protected his people in the book of Esther. I believe there are a few takeaways for us today from this passage as we close this morning. First, God, through Esther's request, redeemed the children of Israel. God is providing redemption. And God, through the work of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, redeems all who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 7.25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Listen, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Even as Esther found her way to the king, even as she went to King Ahasuerus, and she said, O king, I plead, I beseech you on behalf of my people. O king, uh, there's a death sentence on them. Haman has tricked you. And even as Esther brought intercession to the throne, there is one that is making intercession in the throne today, the throne of heaven. And that one is none other than Jesus Christ himself, the great intercessor. And and he is there ever interceding on your behalf and on mine. And when Satan brings accusation and when Satan says we're not worthy of heaven and we're, he reminds God of our sin, Jesus shows forth those scars. He reminds uh, all of heaven of the blood that was shed. He is the great intercessor. Thank God this morning that we have an intercessor whose name is Jesus Christ. Amen. We see not only the intercessory picture from Esther's life, but I want you to see something that was mentioned in the last sentence of this chapter. And notice it says in the last verse uh, of, chapter number, of chapter number 8, and many of the people of the land became Jews. Now, I want you to pause for a moment and think of this. What would happen if there was such an outpouring of prayer and revival and power in the church. What would happen if God so demonstrated revival upon the churches of America that many would become Christians because they saw the power of God in our midst? Amen. This was the revival that was taking place. People were turning to God because they said, wow, God's hand is on those people. God has protected those people. God put Esther there. God put Mordecai there. And the whole nation was realizing there is a God in heaven that is with these people. Oh, would be to God that America would realize there is a God in heaven who is with the children of God, the Christian today. What a great picture of revival and what a great request of prayer that every one of us as Christians should make. Dear God, may your glory 
glory rest in our lives and in our families and in our churches once again that people will see your glory in your church even as they saw your glory in the lives of the Jews of Esther's day. May it be said of our day as well.